And let me make a few opening comments about uh, governance. So we've got you know wonderful people then uh, to take this conversation to Hello. the next level. These days, California is widely considered to be a broken state. Credit rating agencies rank the state at the very bottom. National commentators compare California to Greece or General Motors. And in the PPIC statewide survey, approval ratings for state leaders and the public's level of trust in government has been at or near record lows all year. In our November election survey, Last, released last week, 68% of those who, who went to the polls in November said the state is headed in the wrong direction. 81% disapproved of the legislature. 76% said the state is run by a few big interests. And this is, has become my favorite uh, finding of 2011, 81% disapproved of the way that the governor and legislature are working together in making public policy today. That last number, by the way, was a dramatic increase from what we had seen four years ago when Californians went to the poll. Next year doesn't look like it will be an easy one. Once again, the governor is starting with a major budget deficit and sharp divisions within the legislature have already emerged about how to close the gap. This time looks especially tough since voters last month added new restrictions to the budget options available for Sacramento, even as they lowered the vote threshold from a super to a simple majority to pass a budget. So what's wrong and how can it be fixed? It's not a new question. As we've seen in recent years, part of the difficulty is simply identifying the problem. Is it the people we elect who can't get along? Is it the decision-making process? Is it an antiquated budget system? Is it, is it the dysfunction in state and local relations? Or does the initiative process hamper the performance of any representative government? Or is it the way our economy has been performing and how we go about collecting taxes to pay for services? These are all questions about the types of problems that, um, that, that exist for governance today. This year, voters took a few steps intended to improve conditions in Sacramento. They approved the new open primary process for selecting office holders. They eliminated the requirement of a two-thirds majority to pass the state budget. They also affirmed their earlier decision to establish a citizens commission to draw new political boundaries for the legislature. In a PPIC Pew Center on the state's uh, survey earlier in the year, California stands out among five fiscally, state stre uh, fiscally stressed states. 79% said that major changes are needed in the state budget process, and 60% said that major, major changes are needed in the state and local tax system. So voters may not be finished with, their, uh, with the reforms that they have in mind. Still other recent reform efforts did not succeed. Tax reforms proposed by the Bipartisan Commission for a 21st Century Economy were rejected. The legislature's special committee on reform failed to reach conclusions, and two nonprofit efforts to reach the 2010 ballot with questions about bu bu budget reforms and a constitutional convention were ultimately stalled. Since recent progress on reform issues has been mixed, one question is how much improvement should be expected from the changes that were improved, and how much, if any, more is needed to resolve the difficulties in Sacramento. This question will be part of our discussion today, as well as some discussion about how things will get done in Sacramento in the next year. It's my great pleasure to introduce John Myers. John is the Sacramento Bureau Chief for KQED in California Report, which is heard in 29, states from, uh, 29 stations across the state. John is one of the most respected and well-known and insightful political journalists in Sacramento today. And he's one of the, the, the also one others. of the, the best heard voices six, uh, around the state six at this point in time. <laughs> um, but I also might mention, and just for a, a, a bit of a plug for uh, the KQED website, um, his, the column that he writes every day, um, I have, have now, uh, I now see as, as a must read to see what John has to say, not just what 
uh, uh, in writing as well as, uh, as what uh, he has to say on his radio station. So we thank you, John, for moderating Thanks. this session, and I will leave my two friends in your good hands. Oh, wow. I, I don't know who that person you introduced was. Thank you. <laughs> that, that, um, thanks for letting me do this. And, and these, these are the stars of this discussion. I'm just going to try to provoke them to see if we can have the second time today that a, an obscenity is used in a PPIC event. Did By you the way, if you look at the dictionary, you'll find a star is defined as a mass of hot, noxious gas. <laughs> okay, so let me figure out where that. Um, a lot of you know these two gentlemen, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't give them a, a somewhat of a proper introduction. You're looking at two of the people who probably know the most about California government that you're going to find, both the inside and outside of it, uh, primarily, of course, from their inside experience. Um, to my left, I guess to my right, that's perfect, uh, ideologically. Uh, would, be the, uh, would be the former speaker of the California State Assembly, Bob Hertzberg from Los Angeles, who uh, has been very involved in a lot of government reform efforts over the last few years. And to my right, uh, the esteemed Jim Brulte, former leader in the Republican Caucus of the State Assembly and the State Senate. Um, and uh, two gentlemen, as I said, who, who know an awful lot about where we've been and, and I think have a lot of interesting ideas about where we're going. Um, I think Mark kind of alluded to this, and, and so what I thought we'd do is kind of talk a little bit about some of these, and of course, as the format is, let you ask some questions of these gentlemen. Um, but for, you know, there's a need to talk about solutions and ideas, but I think there's also a, a strong desire to talk about what is the cause of the problems. And, and you, all, you, you both have been looking at it a lot, and, and I'm curious maybe to pose the question this way, not so much just generally what is the cause of the problems, but, but are the problems from, from your long viewpoint, are they, the, are they new? Are they the same? Are they part of a continuum uh, from when you served? Um, what, what do you think? I'll start well, Mr. Bulte. Well, I think they're greater, but let, let me take three minutes and give a short history lesson because I, I believe that if you can define or establish a structure, um, you can pretty much guarantee certain outcomes. Um, Everybody wants to know why Sacramento is so polarized today. Um, and the, the, the reason is because it's, it's accidentally or intentionally designed to be. And let me explain what I mean. From 1932 to 1964, we had non-ideological political parties. Um, you know, when I was a kid, they used to say there's not a dime's worth of difference between the two parties. And there really wasn't. Politics was, the parties were based on class, not ideology. That's why they used to balance tickets. You know, you had moderate and conservative Democrats, moderate and conservative Republicans, and whenever one wing, you know, when the uh, conservative wing won, they picked a moderate as a running mate for president. Those of you who are close to my age remember the Rockefeller and the Goldwater wing of the Republican Party, Scoop Jackson versus the McGoverns in the Democratic Party. That began to change in 1964. Uh, with the speech that Goldwater made, with the passage of the Civil Rights Act uh, in that same general time frame, parties began to morph away from class towards ideology as you had conservative Southern Democrats start saying, I got more in common with Barry Goldwater than Lyndon Johnson, and you had liberal Republicans say, I got more in common with Lyndon Johnson than I do Barry Goldwater. When I was a kid, Republicans couldn't win anything in the South, but we were pretty competitive in New England. Today, Democrats can't win much in the South, but they pretty much own New England. So the parties began the process in 64 of moving away from class towards ideology, and that started in 64, and it's accelerated. <clears throat> Here in California, um, we have seen a couple of things that have exacerbated that ideological divide. Uh, when I ran for the legislature in 1990, about 9% of the electorate were declined to state. Declined to state voters are true independents. They declined to state a political party affiliation. About 49% of the voters were part of Bobby's party. About 39% were a part of my party, and about 9% were declined to state. Today, that decline to state number is over 20%. Right. Bobby's party went from 49 down to 42, popped back up a little bit as a result of the Obama-Clinton primary fight. My party went from 39 down below 31. 
And who were those people that left and moved from our parties to decline to state? They were moderates, moderate Democrats who didn't like the left wing of his party and moderate Republicans who didn't like the right wing of my party. Now, what happens to a conservative party when you void moderates? or a liberal party when you void moderates. You make the conservative party more conservative and the, moder the liberal party more liberal. So when I ran in 1990, conservatives had influence in my party primary. They don't today. They have dominance. Liberal, liberals used to have influence in his party's primary. They don't today. They have dominance. So you have this national trend towards greater ideology as you have more people becoming pure independents. And they are, by the way, they're the ones that hold sway in elections. This is exacerbated by a couple of things here in California, three things actually. One, uh, the way we pick our parties, and we'll, uh, our nominees, and we'll get to that because the yeah. voters have changed how we picked our nominees. But the way it was up until this last election, if you wanted to be the Republican nominee, you stood on the far right, you didn't let anybody flank you on the right, you won. Um, your primary, same thing on the left, only in reverse. That's one issue we'll talk about. Two, um, safe seats with redistricting where we have few competitive seats. Where you have competitive seats, you have more moderate folks. We don't have many competitive seats. We should have a few more as a result of another voter initiative. The third is term limits. If I said only Nixon could go to China, most of you would know what I meant. Um, Richard Nixon was a president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> but here you had a lifelong anti-communist who for 30 years gave voice to this hard line. So when he went, when he announced he was going to communist China, I mean, not the real China, not Formosa, but red China, um, you know, I, he, he wasn't creamed by the right. I mean, my father was a diehard <clears throat> conservative, and I remember the day that Richard Nixon announced he was going to China, and my father was angry. He, in frank, angry isn't the right word. What he said was, I don't like this. I don't understand this. But I trust Richard Nixon, because for 30 years, Nixon had given voice to his view. In a term-limited environment, you're not around long enough to establish your bona fides with your core constituencies to ever be able to cross them with impunity. When I was Republican leader in the assembly and Willie Brown was speaker, the special interests needed us. That's not the norm today. Now the legislative leaders need the special interests. It's a paradigm shift brought about as a result of term limits. And finally, the rise of independent expenditure committees and campaign finance. If every one of you in this room decide to give me um, 3,900 bucks, which is the max you could give me if I were running for the legislature, you still wouldn't give me as much money as SEIU or the California Dental Association or the California Teachers Association can spend against me running in the legislature. So this rise of independent expenditure committees has weakened governors and exacerbated the tensions as legislators of both parties become more responsive, not only to their base, but to the independent expenditure committees of the groups who are part of those base. So we're, we're, we don't get bipartisan cooperation because if you want to survive as a legislator in Sacramento, it doesn't matter what party you're in, you can't be bipartisan. Just ask the six Republicans who voted for tax increases the two leaders were removed from their leadership positions. One fellow was almost recalled. He would have been if they actually gathered signatures in the right place. Roger Nilo, a really good man who represented this area for most uh, of the last decade, lost a Republican primary. There was no reward for that bipartisan activity. And by the way, if the Democrats had done anything to horribly disadvantage organized labor, I suspect the reverse would have been true for them. So I think there's a structural disconnect, and that's why we have the polarization we do. But I also think what you're saying, too, and, 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 and let's bring you into it, is, is that sounds like a bit of a continuum. It, it has been a long process growing to where we are today. Do you, do you see some of that as well, Bob? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, the, the, my question is this. You know, when I, when I analyze this, whether it's through California Forward or the Think Long Committee or my role at uh, 
at the Public Policy Institute on the board is, you know, really, what is the problem we're trying to fix, right? You, you know, Mr. Merksimer, who was going to leave but stayed because he made sure I didn't say anything bad about him, you know, takes the same view that Brulte, that Brulte has about term limits, open primary, and, and redistricting. And yeah, are those okay? Those are important issues to me in the near term. It makes people a little bit more educated, not making as many stupid mistakes. Uh, um, maybe there's some better policy that comes out of the process in the scheme of things. But I don't think it gets really to the underlying constitutional challenge that we face. And, and I think it's a little different because the world is a different place. The United States is not as predominant economically on the one hand, and democracy is different. I talked to Vic Fazio, and he always says, you know, in my day, diversity was the Rotarians against the Qantas Club folks, you know? <laughs> to, today, there's real voices in the caucus and, how, and, and, and what happens. It's not conservatives or liberals or different parts of the state, and new tools for those voices. So to, I step back and say, yes, are there short-term problems that are needed to be solved, the, 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 the triage, if you will, the budget and the triage issues. Those, those are triage, but not really long-term issues. To me, the problem is what kind of California do we want in 2025 or 2040 about as far of an event horizon as we can see? I don't put it out that far because if you just look at context, I, I was talking to some people earlier and talking about Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and, and when Arnold Schwarzenegger took the oath of office, Mark Zuckerberg hadn't yet even thought about, well, maybe thought about it, but, or somebody else thought about it, but hadn't, yeah. actually, <laughs> hadn't actually incorporated Facebook, right? Google, which dominates the planet, wasn't incorporated until September 28th, 1998, eight years after Jimmy Brulte got elected to the legislature. You know? But Jimmy Brulte invented Google, I want you to know. <laughs> Him and Al Gore got a club. But in any event, um, <laughs> in any event, so the question becomes, as Californians, what are we about? Who are we? We're these inventive, creative folks that have done in unbelievable things, that have, that have created a brand that as I have spent the last number of years working in my renewable energy business, traveling over 100 countries, everybody knows California. They don't know Mississippi. They, 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 don't, know, they don't know Chicago, but they all know California, whether it's because of the movies or whatever. But it is at the corner of it, I think, this immigrant experience, not just south of the border, but every single country of the best and the brightest wanting to come here. Manifest destiny that ended at the ocean as we came westward and now comes globally to this place. And that magic is what allows us to sell our products and to be inventive and to be the place when Van here was talking about raising the capital for, 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 for um, green technology. Unfortunately, we're raising it but spending it someplace else. But people are coming here. And there's something about that that gives us our value add. You know, I, I would do business in China and people were making 200 bucks a month and people said, why don't you go to Vietnam? You can get them for a hundred bucks a month. I mean, that's the mentality. Actually, it was in Vietnam a couple months ago, just checking it out, not for that purpose, but to just, <laughs> but to just, but to just try to understand it. And so, so the question is this, as I see it. Yes, the short-term issues, we've got to deal with the budget. You know, uh, 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 Brown fits in over that whole thing, and obviously, as he should, doing the workout, figure out what he's going to do. You know, we've got term limits coming up on the ballot. We've got uh, uh, the, the rainy day fund to try to smooth out the problem coming up on the ballot. We had the 50% the, the plus one, whether you agreed or disagreed. We had this issue to stop the fees, whether you agree or disagree. There's a number of big structural issues, open primary with ABLE and other things. Cal Ford was involved in a lot of these things, but and redistricting, of course, the, two, the three initiatives in that regard. But to, to, I just want to frame it in the sense, and we can talk about these in the short term, but in the long term, and, and, and the reason I focus on the long term, because I think the long term gives vision and gives hope to folks that yes, these are triage and we don't have an end, you know, it's not just California that's fallen in the ocean, but there really is a vision to a fix for California. And that we understand as we work on these issues of term limits and, and open primary and budget fixes and pay-go systems and the like, that those are just, you know, patching up the patient in the ER, that then we're gonna take them out and they're gonna run a marathon because that's what we do in California. I'm not inspired by the idea often of looking to other states. We don't look to other states. We invent what happens in other states, look to us. We're California, that's what we're about. And so the question now is, and I'll just end on this is to frame it out, is what are the pro what's the problem you're trying to solve? And to me, it, it manifests itself on two legs of a stool. The first is really making democracy legitimate. 
You cannot have a democratic institution where people are turning out in elections where seven people turn out. It, it, it's just handing the keys of, uh, uh, of the kingdom over to other folks. It's the reason why Sacramento is so disconnected. No one knows it, gets it, understands it. Jim represented near a million people when he was in the state senate. Are you kidding? It's crazy. It doesn't work. It never did. And you got to inspire people and, and really invest the depth and dimension of the democracy in a place where they've got skin in the game. And two, we got to be competitive. Democrats and Republicans can argue over the dough all day long. You want to give it here, you want to do this, you take care of this, no problem. But you got to have the money. And, and the money means that you, have, you can't be Detroit that has 40 square miles of farmland within its perimeters of its city. You got to be a place that is energetic and dynamic and, and can pay people and do all the things in high wage, this is in health care and all the things that we want. And so that's all about trying to be competitive. In my personal point of view, I don't think you can get in this game. It's not California forwards, although we had part of this and certainly uh, uh, with respect to Think Long Committee that Nicholas Berguin's engaged in and others, no, Laura Tyson's was part of that. You know, we're beginning that process, but I believe it's a devolution of power. I believe that 70 to 75 percent, uh, of the 75 to 75 percent of the services that are paid for at the state level and administered at the local level should be administered at the local level and that you create competition and, and deal with all the kinds of issues that the business community, that, that, that uh, other communities that want to have a voice are allowed to engage in and you can fix it at the state where you make sure you have minimum standards like you have at, at, at the Serrano case and, and certain other kinds of standards and create as much creativity and competition among the regions as possible, which gets you to the end game, not so much. So to me, who cares, you know, the issue of term limits or redistricting? They're not going to be able to do much. The, the action's going to be down at the local level. Well, but I'm trying to find a, a, a common thread between what the two of you said, I mean, one of the things that strikes me, and this is maybe one other larger topic to talk about, and I should also say I left out part of, uh, of Bob Hertzberg's resume. He is the co-chair of California Forward, which is a group that has come forward. And Lucas over here is one of the big Chizo members. <laughs> hey, he's got, probably got several in here. So uh, but, folks who, but folks who are involved in looking for these uh, governance reform ideas over the last uh, year, year and a half, right. two years? I yeah, basically forget. what happened yeah. is five of the foundations, Irvine, I saw somebody here from Irvine earlier, have put together, they basically said, look, we are frustrated that the state is up and down and all over the place. Let's step back, try to put a bunch of folks together to be thoughtful about this and try to figure out some solutions that are action oriented as opposed to just another set of white papers. And so we have had some very tough discussions, Donna, and really difficult in trying to figure out some solutions and trying to come up with ways and really grappling with this dimension of a long-term view versus as Connie Rice likes to say, who serves on our board at, uh, at Donna serves on the board of PPIC too, who's on the board of the, with the Velociraptor in the room or whatever that, I don't even know what those things are. You know, no, you're, you're Velociraptor. You're, Velociraptor. You're messing with the, with the, with the tarantula in the, in the sink when there's a Velociraptor in the shower. And we're trying to deal with the Velociraptor. Well, let me ask you Thank on you. that, uh, that uh, I'm trying to think of what the appropriate animal is next. Uh, but, but, one of the things that both of you talked about, um, or, or in, your, in, in your opening remarks, you both alluded to things that happen that the voters make decisions about in the state. Um, you talked a little bit about term limits. I've heard you talk, uh, make a very good presentation before um, about term limits in particular, which I know is not your hot topic, but bear with me, I'm getting to something here. But, but in term limits, you've talked about before that, I've heard you say before a, a new freshman knows where the ATM is in the basement of the Capitol, which I was actually down there yesterday and none of them were there um, when they were sworn in, that they are dealt, they're dealing with issues that are huge, budget issues, they're asked with these you know, very large tasks that- I just want you to know we show them where the ATM is in the Hertzberg Capital Institute, <laughs> part of the deal. <laughs> where freshman legislators are put really to the test, but that is, that, that is somewhat an impact of term limits in the state. But the, but the larger point I was going to make about, about what the voters do, because you, know, you raised a point about democracy and, and getting the public engaged. And, uh, and maybe this is part of me growing up back east and being an outsider looking in. But you know, no state, obviously, we all know no state is like California. But no state is like California in a couple of ways. I mean, obviously, we're a nation state, 38 million people. We have a direct democracy system that is the most powerful direct democracy system in the world. Uh, we do not allow changes to ballot measures in ways. We have to go back to the voters to change things multiple times. And, and, and there is a bit of a disconnect, especially when you look at the engagement, it seems like, of the voters. I mean, they don't all turn out to vote. We've had a fairly high, it looks like, voter turnout for November, but that is somewhat unusual, I guess. My point here is, is 
How do you engage the voters, the public, in a way, in understanding how to fix this? And, and do you have to fix the thing that they love the most, which is their direct democracy system? I mean, that's one way of talking about it. I mean, a lot of people have, have looked around at, at, you know, what reform means and where you start. You start here in Sacramento, you start on the local level, you start on the relationship level, but electoral reform keeps coming back into this, and the voters are somewhat responsible for the system they have. Well, look, I, you know, I, I think when you use the word fix, it means you should try to improve. You know, the reformers of California thought we ought to have three special things. The initiative, which allows you all to write a law. The referendum, which allows you all to undo a law the legislature passes and the governor signs. And the recall, those, not every state has those. Um, and uh, you know, by, uh, my general view is the voters generally get it right. And the problem with any, <coughs> the problem with any attempt to correct the flaws in the initiative process is you can't take politics out of them. I mean, can you imagine the legislature fixing an initiative that's going to go on the ballot before it goes on the ballot? You, you will not be able to stop them from being political. Heck, in this last election, the attorney general of this state wrote a title and summary of a ballot initiative that the proponents went to court and the judge said he got it wrong and the judge ordered the title and summary that the attorney general wrote to be corrected. Uh, and by the way, one of my friends polled that. It was related to AB or uh, S, uh, 23. Prop 23 and the initiative that governor, the title and summary that governor-elect Brown wrote um, gave that initiative 12 points less support in the poll than the initiative that the court said was a more accurate reflection. Now look, I like Jerry Brown, I think he's a good man, I hope he's a very successful governor, but multiply that by 120 trying to fix, and you can talk theoretically about having the legislature fix initiatives, but politicians don't fix, politicians are political. But therein lies the problem, I mean, you're, you're, you've been leading this effort at governance reform, and part of it's got, I mean, there, there is an element of electoral reform that has to be done. This almost sounds like an unfixable situation because politics is always going to bleed in it, whether it's the legislature or whether it's the interest groups that we've talked about, that if you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, that, that seems almost unfixable. I'm giving I don't up. Use I guess so. I'm out of here. Well, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> it's unfixable. What do you want? But how do, how, do you, but how do you address that? I mean, you've been looking, your group, California Four, has been looking at all these different ideas, all these different ways. You've looked at a lot of other measures that it's are It's hard. You know, yeah. it's like, it's a George Mitchell on the Northern Ireland deal talked about he had 700 days of failure and one day of success. Get a life. Keep staying in the game. You know, we got in, we tried on certain things, we talked about stuff, other people picked it up. You just dog it out and you keep trying. And to me, the way you do it uh, uh, is you just start out with ideas that where do you want to go? What's your deliverable? What's your strategic objective? And, and what are you really trying to fix? And don't keep your nose up against the glass with respect to the, what happens in Sacramento because, you know, I just think that, that the world's changed. All these checks and balances, they're too slow. I, I, I mean, I personally would do a unicameral legislature. I know a lot of people in this room cringe at that thought. But I think it creates, it, it, it's an antidote to the part-time legislature. It creates a, a situation where you have a stronger legislative branch, less BS back and forth between the two houses. And I think it creates people, government close to the people. You've got districts of 300,000 where someone can get elected rather than just a bunch of people raising a ton of dough. You've got to be creative and inventive and figure out ways to understand the architecture of what you're trying to accomplish and figure out how to make it happen. And, and your point do it in a way that either A, you, you know, do the head fake and you're able to, 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 to beat out the interest groups. And let me tell you an example of the head fake, because one of the reforms that, Mr. that the Senator Brulte over here failed to mention in his rendition of reforms 100 years ago, I forgive you for that, sir, is not only was it the referendum, the initiative, and the recall, but the other element was there was a statewide property tax and the state didn't think it was worth anything. The locals asked for it. They took it, and it became the foundation for building and bonding and all the stuff that built local government, right? It was a head fake. Ah, it's not worth nothing. Can you find a head fake in the play? I think, quite frankly, I'll say this publicly, that you know the whole local government thing's a head fake. Why? What do Democrats want? They want money to pay for you know, labor contracts and things like that. You poll in Sacramento, 14% of the people will pay for 
for, for tax increases. That means a lot of Democrats won't have a tax increase, won't pay for tax increases. Why? Sacramento is waste, fraud, and abuse because it's far away and no one knows what it is and you can't see it and feel it and touch it. 54% of the folks will pay for tax increases locally because it's something that if they get mad at somebody, they can grab their city council person in the supermarket and express their points of view. And so, and so it gets that goal where it's a, it's, it's a real unity. And in terms of empowerment of ethnic communities who didn't have power, all of a sudden, the young Latina or African American or Asian American who, who gets elected to a local office and finds that all the power is in Sacramento and that they think that they're powerful, actually, you can actually give them power so they can actually do something. And there's a real sh paradigm shift in terms of Bull Connor with the fire hose at local government now versus Naleo, which has 5,400 members. So did I just hear the former speaker of the assembly say that ideas for realignment of local state government is a head fake? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you did. I'm that's a reporter, so it's hang okay. on a you heard it. Me but it's a good head out. fake. But yeah. it's the same thing that with the tax deal. So you get in the game and you try to make it work. Or you find a guy like Nicholas Bergewin and you raise the money and you go to war. Well, let me... <laughs> Let, his, his, name is, his name has come up a couple of times, so let me go ahead and get you to talk about that for a moment. This gentleman, Nicholas Berguin, who is a, um, you, you know him now, I guess, at this point. I, I, I only know him by reputation, but is a gentleman who, I guess, lives on an airplane? Is that right? Because you Somewhere. met him on an airplane. He doesn't have a particular home in the world, but right. he's very wealthy, and he's very interested in reform in California, and has, uh, according to some of the reports, has said he'd be willing to spend as much as $20 million dollars which you as a guy leading California forward, if you'd had $20 million last year, would we be having a different conversation this year? What do you think, Lucas? Do you have a different conversation? I think so. Um, yeah. Talk about this, this, this gentleman's interest. You met with him. You flew to Panama to meet him, you were right. telling me. You don't right. have to tell the whole story of how you got into Panama. But what is he, what is he interested in? What is he, no, you have to I told Bryson him. the story. What, what, <laughs> what does he want? Where, what is he interested here's in? His, here's what, his deal. He's yeah. 49 years old. He's, he's a, they call him the homeless billionaire, and he's a really bright guy. And he's, his, he, his, his father was an art dealer. He's traveled around the world, made a lot of dough. And you're right. I mean, we spent six hours with Hertzberg notebooks and briefing and all this stuff in his plane. Uh, coming uh, 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 from Panama, but but the the um, what his interest is this? He's really interested in this whole issue of democracy, and he sees authoritarian governments like China being able to take our pants, so to speak, and that we're slow and deliberative with checks and balances, and it's very difficult for this new world order for us to compete. So how does democracy work? How do you create this? And, it, and it's exactly the thought I've been grappling with. How do you have this vibrant democracy that engages people, that works, but still competes at a global basis where anybody in any company, uh, I talked to, to uh, Betsy Morgan in terms of their company, they reinvent yourself every 18 months. Go look at how everybody's businesses, or business folks here around the room, how your businesses change, and so government has to be reinventive. So he's really interested in that and sees California as a bellwether. He's gotten together folks from uh, uh, Germany and Brazil and other parts of the world trying to engage in this conversation. And so he's pulled together a group to work in complete partnership with California Forward, uh, it, it, which is called the Think Long Committee. George Schultz, Condoleezza Rice, Lord Tyson's part of it, Willie Brown, Governor, uh, Governor Davis, a whole host of, of really interesting folks, uh, uh, the Google folks, uh, uh, the gentleman who's the CEO of Google, Eric, Eric Schmidt, and other people, and we've engaged in conversations, and we're gonna have a number of meetings working in conjunction with California Forward, and I hope the extent we can do partnerships as best as we can on an appropriate basis with PPIC to start really drilling in and finding out is there a way, and then where California Forward is limited because its money is from foundations and can do backup research and outreach and, and a lot of homework, the money that comes in from Berguin, both his personally and other money that will be raised is political to actually run campaigns and to really have the money to hopefully, you know, engage in a discussion and maybe win, maybe lose, but get in the game. Given, given that billionaires don't always have great track records in politics, it's just a few weeks comment. What is he, what is he, sorry, couldn't, couldn't help myself. What, what is he committed to do? Just the process or is he committed to actually give you whatever money you need well, to make involved. it happen? No, the process. It's just the process. Okay. He's brought the people together, a, a number of people that, that, are, that are knowledgeable in government, some business people, David Bonderman who serves Texas Pacific and on the board of GM and, and others and, and Terry Semmel and some others to try to put a bunch of bright, bright people around the room and come up with some suggestions. And, you know, we're working very closely at Cal Forward with, with him to, to uh, 
and, and actually uh, uh, Tim Gage, the, the former director of finance, uh, Mike Chinest, are working both with California Forward and, and with Nicholas Perdue and really kind of advising with really smart folks to try to figure out how do you fix this deal and do it in a way that maybe, as, as uh, Jim was alluding to earlier, you can maybe have enough money to get away from some of the politics or beat it. Okay. Well, that, that, I mean, that's the interesting part because, I mean, so many reform efforts, which you've worked on, um, the folks who wanted to maybe have a, a constitutional convention last year and that, and that effort didn't, came up short, uh, they all struggle against the fact that the status quo, the, 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 the parts of the world of, of the body politic that, that like things the way they are, are powerful and, and will fight back. And so... But look, a voter, I don't think voters get it wrong, and I wouldn't... Look, six times they fought for redistricting reform. Governor Schwarzenegger twice, he won it the, the second time he fought for it, and I think the sixth time. Right. The so-called open primary or blanket primary. People have been fighting for that for a long time. That's a reform. Uh, you know, fixing the budget process is a reform. I, I don't think the budget's the problem. Yeah. I think the budget's a symptom of a problem. Uh, you know, the budget's just, I mean, we incent people to use services and we disincent them to uh, create jobs. We have a system reliant on the wealthy for, for uh, a lion's portion, lion's share of the budget. That, but anytime you want to fight for a reform, Sometimes you have to fight two or three times, but ultimately, if it's the right idea, it tends, it tends to win. It may take a decade or two. Did you two. support redistricting reform? Yes. As, as, as a man involved uh, quite deeply in Look, redistricting. Bob, and I, Bob was what? Speaker of the Assembly. I was the minority leader when we created these districts. That was kind of the point I was going. Thank yeah. you. Look, I, <laughs> I supported redistricting reform before I got elected. I supported it while I was elected, and, and I support it now. But, you know, I, the law said we had to draw districts. We drew districts. Didn't make it right that we were drawing these districts, but it was the law, and we fulfilled our obligations. That particular one, though, if I, if I could just stay on that for a moment, uh, a memory lane moment for the two of you on that, because that is one of those where I, as a reporter, have found that, you know, a lot of people always said redistricting is arcane and the voters don't quite, they're not dialed into it they finally did seem to get it at a certain point. I mean, they understand enough of it. And, and, and so many times what happened a decade ago in California was talked about. Um, and so I just find it interesting where we talk about reforms and, and, and restoring kind of trust and faith in the people. Um, and yet you have to acknowledge that part of that, you know, one, one small element was you all trying to figure out what to do in a, in a very different world, wearing different hats in a political environment. Yeah. Look, I, you know, I got to tell you something. We just, I, I, I supported the reforms. My former chief of staff, Diane Griffiths, is in this room where she was earlier as chief of staff for the Board of Regents at UC now. She was always getting mad at me for this. But, but um, I did it for a different reason. Let me just explain it to you, because I think it's important to understand. Look, when you read the cases, and I read them all, and you read the 14th Amendment and the Voting Rights Act and the like, by and large, so Jimmy made this point the other day, where another thing, 85, 90% of the stuff is going to come out the same way. People live next to each other, communities of interest and the like. Um, we had, with computers today and the like, you, you can uh, draw districts, the hearings we held, and all the other stuff. But it is one of these things that fundamentally to folks feels unfair, that People are drawing things for their own interests. Are there interests that you draw somebody out of your district or whatever? Yeah, but does it going to affect the outcome? Is a district going to be a D versus an R? In only a small number of cases. I ran for the legislature and the other party was in power. We had 39 seats, they had 41. When I left after the leaving speaker, we had 50 seats. And, and those were on seats that were drawn by, uh, uh, by, by the courts. Okay, so, so I don't think it's really a gigantic issue, but it's a confidence issue. And as a Democrat, confidence in government is everything. When people have confidence in government, they'll support the kinds of programs that I care about. They'll help people because they think that the stuff works. When they think that people in government are a bunch of bozos, 
then they don't want to write a check for anything because you're wasting your money. So I did it strategically, quite frankly, because I think it's the, in that sense it's the right thing to do, and I didn't think we were really giving up anything of any consequence. We drew our lines, nobody really challenged our lines at the assembly, and we went from 50 seats to 48 seats after the election. That's not the, 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 the story that's being told, but quite frankly, that's what happened. So, you know, again, the architecture of power, who cares? What, you're not giving away anything. I didn't think Prop 26 gave away anything on Sinclair Paint. I thought the whole argument was a joke, but it was a way that consultants could blow up each side and get them all amped up about whether it's a fee or a tax, which never was really used in any big numbers. And who cares? Take it off the table. It sets the table for reform for the next stage. And you took a lot of flack about that in California Forward because you all put an idea forward about the fee issue as well. Well, we didn't year. put it forward. We, we never well, got to support yeah, it. The Democrats like it. me killed it, but you know, but we, 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 but there was a lot of discussions among the Republicans. <laughs> what? You know? Let me, let me, since, since I think both of you, and especially uh, Jim Brulte, you've said that you think the budget problems are a symptom, not necessarily, uh, obviously not a cause. Sure. Um, but I wanted to run down a quick list. I was looking before we started at at least a, a short list of bills that have been introduced in the last 24 hours to reform the budget process. And see, he's already chuckling. I can tell I, what he feels about it. I haven't them. seen them. But uh, is Mark here, Senator Sonny A still here? Uh, I saw him earlier. But anyway, one of them is, yeah, he's, he's involved in at least some yeah. of them. So here's a, here's a short list of ones that came out in the last 24 hours. Uh, and right, some of these you know about because they are sponsored by California Forward. You guys endorse them, support them. Uh, a two-year budget. Um, and the two-year budget also would have to include um, a projection of revenues and expenditures for five years out. Yeah. So it would have to be more than just a short-term document but a longer-term document. Uh, a separate bill would, um, um, I didn't see the bill language, so I'm just kind of uh, paraphrasing here, about performance-based budgeting. I don't know how far it goes into that, whether it's a... That was Lois Wolk. Yeah, it's Same in bill as the last time. Uh, Lois Wolk and Bob Huff, I think, yeah, is yeah. the co-sponsor uh, co right. there. Um, uh, a bill that says all budget and trailer bills have to be in print for 72 hours uh, so that the public and everyone can read them. Yeah, um, Republican must have done that. Yeah, because Republicans usually criticize the bills for not being in print. Um, and a bill that says the budget has to include and account for all unfunded liabilities facing the state. Pension liabilities, health care liabilities, infrastructure sure. liabilities. Based on that small list, what, 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 Look, what do you think? Look, I think those are all good. But, you know, they won't do anything unless, again, I started by saying if, if I can define the structure or you can define the structure, you can pretty much guarantee the outcomes. Look, what is it that we know about politicians on the left and the right, Republicans and Democrats? One, they're all human beings. So that means when it comes to allocating pleasure, they're really good. <laughs> but when it comes to allocating pain, they suck. I mean, no politician shows up when the city is closing the park because they can't afford to have it. But they all want to show up and have their picture taken at the groundbreaking of the park. Right. So, I mean, I got a better one. How about making the legislature and the governor, all 120 of them, uh, plus the governor, um, comply with Sarbane-Oxley law on budget assumptions? Now, that'll get their attention when they come up with a great idea about what the budget's going to look like five years out. <laughs> Because people will lie about it. Why don't we get a budget on time? Because there's absolutely no penalty for not getting a budget on time. Whether you think that's a good idea to get it on time or not. But you know, my, you take human nature into account with every reform you pass. You want to get budgets more on time? Say fine. You don't pass the budget, get it signed into law, we're going to lock the Capitol doors and you don't get to go home. You well, supposedly they're, not going, well that, supposedly they're not going to get paid according to well, Prop but, 25. But you know what? That's Look, tricky, and I'm all right with that, but pay, is, like pay is discriminatory. It if is you're discriminatory. rich yeah. and don't live on your it's income, fair. you are affected differently than someone who's, who's middle class and lives on their income. That's right. So if, if, you know, if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, go ahead, take away his pay. The $1 a year he's taking anyway, he won't miss it. But if you're a poor Democrat or a Republican in the assembly, you take away their pay, they don't Wait a make their a poor mortgage Democrat payment. In the but you know what? what does that mean? There's some assumptions built into that. Democrat or Republican. <laughs> but if you know what, time is something everybody has. But yeah. you know what, if there's a punishment that's real that affects everybody equally, you know, I mean, trust me, you lock these guys down for a week, they don't get to go home, they don't get to do fundraisers, they'll start focusing on their job. That's understanding human nature. Nobody wants to make tough decisions. You, you've got to find ways of forcing them to make decisions. We don't want 
Poor Gray Davis got blamed for bankrupting the state. The dirty little secret is the 2000 budget, the 2000-2001 budget that bankrupted this state was supported by over half the Republicans in the Assembly and a third of the Republicans in the Senate. It was a bipartisan decision. They didn't think they were bankrupt. Because there was money. Because, well, they thought <laughs> they the had time, it. So yeah. if you want to pass reforms, you have to pass reforms that take human nature into account. That's right. Uh, can I build on that, Jim? Because you're exactly right. The, the framers of the Constitution, the genius of who these folks were, were not to judge human beings, but to understand their nature, to align their interests of their self-interests with the common good. That was the genius. So you could get out there and be self-interested, but it helped the community. We're now in a situation where there's this disalignment in, in that situation. But I don't think it's fair to look at politicians to say and say they're all a bunch of rat finks, because they've always been rat finks. Politicians <laughs> always have had their interest, number one, the interest of their supporters and friends, number two, and the interest of everybody else, number three. Go read the stories in the 78 newspapers in Philadelphia at the time of the convention. There were 78 newspapers at that time. And what they talked about from a historical context, that's always been the case. The, the, the challenge we face as adults in the room, people talk about adults in the room, if it's possible, is to say, here's what it is. Let's not criticize it. Let's create a system that works for it by aligning incentives. You know, the... the, the um, the, 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 that, that to me is, 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 is what's so critical in how, in how we do this. And, uh, um, you know, someone made that point earlier, but if you now use that as a watchword for figuring out how you're going to reform the system, because even the budget being late, you know how many people make money on all this stuff? You know how many people whose job it is to create service, to create heartache? In, in, not a lot of kids in the room, are there? Um, <laughs> to create heartache in the room, I mean, heartache because they make money, right? It's, it, it's, they're aligning their interests. Or, you know, people say, oh, there's some group that does something that's self-interest. You know what? Every self-interested dollar gets deposited into somebody's bank account and feeds somebody's family. And they all come in, because we've seen it in government, and for those who've served or been involved in government, they all get a story that the rotation of the earth is going to stop unless you fix the little for stunk in a problem. And, you, you know, that's what happens. And our job is to be architects of the big ideas and marry that with tactical approaches to the day-to-day -to, -day to figure out how we actually reinvent this place given the new world order. Um, so just on, on those particular pieces of legislation, some of them you're involved in. I do yeah. see that Senator DeSonia is in the back back is there. He's, yeah, I think he's looking at his Blackberry now trying to figure out how to get out the room. Um, Where, where's but, Marcuson? But tell me why you like, just tell me really quickly, why do you like that, because I think Senator Brulte makes a very good point here. Why do you like the, 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 the five-year projections? Um, of it, it gets element? beyond the governor. Because, because I do notice, as, yeah. a, as a reporter covering the Capitol, one, one of the things that I find most problematic is, is how these, uh, our revenue projection system seems um, uh, complicated, maybe a little bit archaic. We That's only ridiculous. do it a couple of times yeah. a year. Or, we know, the, 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 dy the dynamism of the, of the California economy. What, what, what do you like about that? Well, the five-year projection, uh, actually, we've talked about that a lot at California Forward, uh, I mean, and the two-year budget creates a, an event horizon beyond the, the current governor's term, whoever that person is. So you always have to look beyond it and get a longer-term view. One of the challenges of democracy, which is why Nicholas calls this thing the Think Long Committee, came in from George Schultz, is that we need to have a longer-term event horizon. And one of the things is we've got this kind of Diet Coke instantaneous uh, system of democracy and we're not thinking about the long-term strategy. The two-year budget, from our point of view, we just talked about this at length at the California Forward Board meeting, is it does a couple of things. One is, at least from my point of view, is that um, by having a two-year budget, you can use one year where you introduce bills and, and concentrate legislation. And the next year you do budget and oversight so that you really hold the executive branch accountable. You have you stop introducing so many for the bills all the time. There's too many bills anyway. It drives everybody crazy. And you create that. And the third thing, from a financial modeling perspective in the flow of the state, what happens in the, in the bond world, I'm an old bond lawyer, and Tim and, and Mike Genest will tell you this, that you can only borrow to the end of the year. That's the authorization. But if all of a sudden on revenue anticipation notes, you can borrow over 14 or 18 months and not have to go out with revenue anticipation right. warrants or IOUs, all of a sudden 
you have some smoothing based upon the ups and downs in the system. So it creates more stability, it avoids all the, the noise of all too many bills, it creates a really intelligent incentive for oversight and an event horizon that thinks long term. But how do you legitimize those revenue and spending projections? Again, how, well, I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you, as much as possible, depoliticize yeah. them? I mean, that goes to what Jim was talking yeah. about, the Sarbanes-Oxley. Right. I mean, one of the big challenges we have is, is that in the budget in California, the, the, the current office holders can make it up and there's no real accountability for the truth. Is there a process? I was talking to Jeanette about this some time ago. Is there a way that you can come up with a process where you have to have kind of truth in numbers? That there has to be some way, almost like with Laura, used to be on the Council of Economic Advisors. We, we, we talked about that, Jim, remember during the energy crisis. We didn't have anybody institutionally in government that we could go to that was a truth teller, right? We had to go to the outside and try to figure it out. How do you make that work? And though maybe that's part of some of the elements of reform. Yeah. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to take some questions from the audience, but I, I want to um, go back to a couple of big uh, topics for a moment. And, and that is, um, it seems as though over the last few years, we've had these discussions that there are things broken in the system in California. Uh, and, you know, we may differ on whether they are big things or small things or how to fix them. Um, but the public has been um, engaged in it some. They have been um, lobbied for particular ballot measures sure. by particular people, and yet the problems continue to persist. And, and, and I do wonder at a certain point whether um, what's happened some is that there's been a case of, of overselling a lot of times. Uh, I mean, in, in some instances, I think that the current governor has uh, promised a lot of things with some of the measures he has said will change things, and they haven't changed it. I don't know whether history will judge him poorly or not poorly on that. Perhaps that's also just part of the politics, not necessarily him. But, um, but isn't there a danger in, in, in telling the public, this will fix it, that'll fix it, and then, you know, this, this long-term nature that, that, uh, that uh, well, Bob Hertzberg talks well, about. Well, first of all, I, I, I think, I, I want to be real clear, I thought all of those budget reform ideas were good ideas and should be implemented, point number one. Point number two, you know, I think Governor Schwarzenegger in three areas are, is going to have a very, very strong um, mm -hmm. uh, legacy. Uh, but, you know, to suggest that the governor overpromised, most of the reforms he enacted haven't even been affected yet. We haven't had a redistricting. We haven't had an open primary. Um, AB 32 hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, so uh, I think fund. Uh, the rainy day fund will be on the ballot. You, by the way, you have to have a rainy day fund as long as you want to rely on the top 1% for 39% of your state income tax. But with all due respect, we have a rainy day fund right yeah, now. But, but you know what? It's not a very good one. Um, so look, I, worked I, on that. I, yeah. I, I think Governor Brown has got a great task in front of him tomorrow. He's going to hold a, the first of a number of seminars to lay it out for the people of California. And you know what? We'll get it right, easy or hard. Um, the question is, how much longer are we going to go? Mm -hmm. And I would argue that structurally, because of the history I laid out and the structure of how people got elected who are here. And by the way, let me be real clear. I am a conservative, pro-life, anti-tax, small government Republican. And if I were in the Assembly Republican Caucus today, I'd probably be considered one of the liberals. Why is that? Why though? Well, but I, I laid that out. It's the well, nature no, of I don't, I don't mean the historical reason, but, 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 but the, the folks who are in that caucus now, wh what is it that they well, disagree yeah, with look, you Well, yeah, look, I mean, and look, it's, it's the nature of, of how we pick our people and the polarization of the electorate. Gavin Newsom, Gavin Newsom and Willie Brown are considered conservatives in San Francisco. God, I don't understand that. But, but you know, they are. They're not... They're not the progressives in San Francisco. They're the Republicans the endorsed Willie. You know? Because they thought, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Republicans endorsed yeah. Willie over Tom Amiano yeah. because when you have a choice between a socialist and a communist, you go with a socialist. But, <laughs> but is but I, I'm just curious, just to try to, to follow on this thread just for a moment, isn't isn't part of it though um, Part of it, though, is a willingness to, to um, a willingness to talk across the aisle, a willingness to compromise, a willing because regardless of your political uh, ideology, you also are someone who you know was yeah, willing to negotiate with his side and vice versa. On, absolutely, on the, yeah. but remember, look, the, the brilliance of the founding fathers was they understood human nature, 
And no matter how much you try to repeal human nature with a law, you can't do it. It's why communism never worked. I mean, communism is a brilliant concept if you look at it on paper. It just doesn't work in the real world. You've got to understand human nature and the nature of how you get elected to the legislature today disincents bipartisan cooperation. It disincents it. And that's why these reforms, I think, were passed by the voters. Mm -hmm. We will see what kind of a change they have. But right now, I mean, there's no Democrat that really, well, I, I won't say no Democrat because I understood Antonio got up here and, and had some tough things to say about the teachers union. But if you're just a rank and file Democrat in the legislature, you don't stand up and take on your core constituencies. It's not helpful And the same for, for Republicans, career. you believe? And if you're a Republican, yeah. you don't stand up and take, you know, look, I mean, Judd Gregg and Tom Coburn are two of the most conservative senators in the United States Senate. They voted for uh, part of this deficit reduction that Erskine Bowles and, and um, company were for. They voted for it, and somewhere in there, there's some tax increases, and the tax, the anti-tax groups on the right are beating the crap out of Judd Gregg and Tom Coburn. They and these guys, these guys are hardcore right-wing <laughs> anti-tax guys. But the plan was kind of a bipartisan plan. They voted for it. The nature of the process here is to not say no to your friends. Do you think you would be completely out of step with your caucus now in the way that he thinks he would have been if you were there? No, I, you know, no, I, I, I look, I, 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 compl I agree with Jim's diagnostic on the conclusion. I don't agree with it in the process. You know, I, I just sit, I sat next to uh, in the swearing-in yesterday to Kevin McCarthy. You know, is one of the leaders in the Congress. Used to be Assembly Republican leader. Used right. to be Assembly Republican leader, and he's, and, and you know, I talked to my friend Dennis Cardozo and a bunch of folks that are back there in Washington, and they tell me it's qualitatively different in Washington, where people don't even talk to each other. Uh, you can't, they, they won't even introduce a bill. One, the one side who's out of the majority they won't even introduce an amendment because they want to hose the other side. It's just, it, it's way past anything that's rational. Here. You know, I went and taught at the Capitol Institute and talked to Republicans. I've sat and done private meetings with some of the Republicans, and they've been very reasonable. They want to do stuff. I haven't found any one of them to deal with, even the person who was the Gilbert Sadio seatmate. Gracious guy. You know, everybody's been, been really good, and, you know, we try to build that camaraderie between the two at the assembly by, doing, by getting them together early. But, but I haven't found any of that, that, that stuff. It, what happens is you come in and you, they say, I can't do it because. I, I can't vote for this because. No one turns around and won't talk to you and browbeat you and that stuff. It's just, I, I haven't, uh, maybe I'm out of touch. No, I look, Bobby, you know? you, Bobby, you and I aren't disagreeing. I mean, yeah, at the no. end of the day, they don't vote. They don't vote. Yeah, they, they don't, don't vote. vote. No. But it's not, they don't They, take they may give you a lame reason for right. why they're not right. doing it, but I'm telling you. But it's not, it's, they're still going out to dinner. They're still talking to each other. Sure. Uh, they're still reaching out to each other. It, it's, it's because the out, they're scared that this taxpayer group or that, this group or whatever is going to say, hey, man, I'd love to do it, but you hear that all the time because the influence of the outside groups and their fear of, their next thing or whatever it might be, or lose an office. Um, one more question from me for a moment, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. I think that's what we're, yes, I got the nod, yes, for that. Um, was that a nod, or are you just waking up? It was a, yeah. Okay, Mark. No, don't worry. I'm just, I was watching you, Mark, trying to, trying to keep you happy. He's still, waiting for, he's still waiting for the expletive that I promised would be in this panel. Um, either what you would want to see or what you think you would see, in the, and, and I don't want to put too artificial, although this is already an artificial question, but too artificial a time limit on it, a year, two years, year and a half, of, of a substantive reform, of a substantive change for California, either one that you would want to see or one that you think is, is likely. And obviously, I know you've got a lot of ideas because you're working on them with California Forward. What, what do you think? Well, well, let me just give you two. Great. Um, one, and you know, hopefully the father of uh, CEQA can help reform it. The California Environmental Quality Act is being used uh, by labor unions to leverage management and negotiations. It's being used by no growthers to stop development altogether. It was never intended to do that. Um, and it's offensive to me that, you know, if you can file a lawsuit, you can bankrupt somebody. Um, if, if you win, you can bankrupt them. If you lose, you can bankrupt them. And by the way, there's no punishment if you lose. So I think we ought to look at CEQA. I think that's a big problem. Second is our tax system. Uh, Mike Genest, who 
sounds like an advertisement for Mike Janess. Mike Janess, before he was Arnold Schwarzenegger's budget director, was my chief fiscal guy. I asked him during the recall, I said, go find out what you can about this Schwarzenegger fellow, um, particularly on the tax side. And he came back and I think the tax year was 2001. I may be off by a couple hundred thousand dollars here, but I think he paid $1.9 million in personal income tax in 2001 for, to the state. Who so, so Arnold, so by the way, he had a good year. I said, okay, now let's say he leaves the state. Tell me what the average new job created in the state of California pays. And because we were doing this in 2003, depending upon the metric you used, it was somewhere between 46,000 and 53,000. I said, let's use 53,000 as the base example. I said, now tell me what they pay in state income tax. You know what? If Arnold Schwarzenegger and his $1.9 million in personal income tax left the state, you have to create over 1,500 new jobs in the state just to keep state tax revenue stable. That's before you add a penny to the state general fund. And you know what, human nature? There's nothing more mobile than rich people and their money. You know, Tiger Woods grew up in this state. Now look, he's not a Cal Poly grad, he's a Stanford grad, so his education isn't all that good. But, <laughs> but before Tiger Woods, turned pro and signed a $40 million contract with Nike. He left California and went to Florida because he knew that 9.3% of 40 million was a lot. So I'd like to see tax reform because we are overly reliant on a very small segment of the California population and we are disincenting them from staying in the state and they are leaving the state. And that in part, is causing some of this budget problem. Those are two just off the top of my head. We could go, I could probably go 10, but it's Bobby's turn. That, I, I, would, I would think that a lot of the ideas that California Forward's working on, you support a lot of them. I mean, Absolutely. they're all kind of like your babies in a way, but what, what, what would you do if I, I asked you I to I would pick finish a out the budget reform stuff, you know, the things that, you know, Mark's reintroduced in, in the legislature, you know, the, the pay go, both for initiatives and for, for bills, just that, and that just clarify that's pay as you go. Pay you as to, you go. You, have you to can't show a source. Show the of, money. Okay. You know, you can't just you know, as as Jim was saying, the, the idea it's easy to, to to be out there when everybody loves you, and you know, you got to show where the money comes from. Both the initiative side of the trade and and the um, legislation, the two-year budget, the same stuff we've been talking about, California for performance-based budgeting. Just because if it gets in play, and you add that to the rainy day fund that I think will pass uh, on the ballot. You now, at least, I think it's not going to be a long-term stuff, but it's going to start moving in the right direction, beginning to say, change some of the culture about oversight and, and try to change in the, aligning the incentives in the proper in the proper places. Secondly, on a personal level, we haven't taken this to California forward yet, but I, I, what the answer is, I don't know. I got some interesting ideas, but I, I really agree with Jim on the tax structure. We've got to change the tax structure to make it work, and I would realign the tax structure so that most of the growth went local, so that you replumb that money, you, can't, you know, back down local, so the growth happens local like it used to happen, and the incentives are down below to grow instead of the incentives up up in top, and and and, and, and it's part of that. I think I actually think the legislature will do this this year in some reasonable way. I know Steinberg and Perez, and others are interested. Um, is the realignment issue to really starting to drill department by department into that was figuring a head fake. out what? Thought that was a head fake. It is in terms of oh. getting support. It's a head fake in terms of its oh. head a head fake. You said that movie about the guy, the last lecture, the head fake. He was doing this thing really for his kids. Yeah. It's not negative. It's a good thing, um, but it's 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 just politics. Instead of hitting somebody head on, you get to the objective. And by uh, the way, when you do way. that, when you create the right incentives, you will yeah. get the right activities. That's right. We take. Over, over half the property tax doesn't go to the local government. Right. There is absolutely no economic incentive for most business entrepreneurs to site a manufacturing facility in a city. Cities don't want them. Cities want strip malls. <coughs> Why? Because Bradley they get Burns. sales tax. A buck, they get a penny. So, you know, you want, yeah, so by the way, we have an overpopulation of, of strip malls. You know, cities fight over Walmart. In my area, Rialto and Fontana are fighting over getting the Walmart. And we they kick want them out the, in LA. And you, you know what? <laughs> Walmart will site in one of those cities because that's where the consumers are. 
but we give cities an incentive so they give away the store and they work real hard to get Walmart, but they don't work real hard to get a manufacturing facility that will actually create a thousand jobs. And I think the common sense of what you're saying in terms of aligning the incentives was exactly uh, positively expressed by Van Jones when he talked about the idea of giving folks money and letting them keep the money in terms of the the whole issue of, of the penal system. I mean, I think the point was well taken. It's just kind of common sense approaches to realigning. The problem is the prison guards will say, oh, that doesn't work, you know. My, just, just, just let me tell you one great story real quickly. Uh, when I was a brand new legislator, I was chair of the Public Safety Committee, and I'm thinking, okay, I started reading the penal code from the beginning to the end. I'm looking from the 911 system to the habeas corpus, and I get to the point of, of prison costs, and at those days, huge overpopulations. What do we got to do? They want to build new prisons. I said, why do we build new prisons? We've got a bunch of women over here that aren't a threat. Let's bring them closer to their families in the community. Let's put them into facilities that work, and take the place that's concrete and put a bunch of hard, uh, the hard guys in that place. Kind of made sense. You know, let me tell you, after a three-hour floor fight, Kurt Pringle leading the other side, you know, for the prison guards, I lost uh, uh, that initiative because I was privatizing prisons, not thinking about that politically, just thinking about how do you deal with the issue of bringing women closer to their families, they're not a threat, saving money from building another really expensive prison, and I lost. And, and, and so that wasn't at all about politics because the Republicans were on the side of, of the unions and I was on the side of privatization, right? And, and uh, you know, often in Sacramento, you'll see those things. I, I, I'm not a big believer in the whole issue of partisanship. I think it's all about interest groups and how they control and how it plays out and, 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 and what the, they, they paint the stage to be. Hmm. Uh, with that, let me, let me ask you all for, for your questions. Open the floor for a moment. I know uh, there's some microphones in the back. You can raise a hand and they'll come find you. Um, I think her microphone's getting before hers is, so. There's a microphone there. Oh, no, sorry, I was wrong. Oh. He beat him up here. We'll do this one first, and then we'll come over here. You must not be in politics. <laughs> Hi, uh, Kim Alexander with the California Voter Foundation. Is this on? Can you hear me? I, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. great. Um, I was just wondering whatever happened to the idea of regional governance and wondered if uh, Willie Brown was going to be maybe bringing that up. I know it was one of his ideas, maybe with the Bergruen group that would get some um, reanimation. And also, um, if you have any comments about the idea that Paul Sappho has been floating around recently about collapsing local governments and sort of looking at the fact that we have lots of smaller, small cities that maybe should be combined into uh, larger sized cities and if that might be part of the realignment uh, ideas that are being discussed. Well, you know, the, the region issue, uh, when I was in government, I formed the Speaker's Commission on Regionalism and Senator Morgan was who's here today as part of it. She's in fact having a the ninth and 10th, am I correct, at Stanford, a stewardship group of all these regional leaders. And the reality is it's been, I, I think, I mean, my personal view is it's, it's critically important. And I don't think you lay, overlay a governmental element on it, but what the, these folks, whether it's through the Bay Area groups, the Central Valley, Los Angeles has the Southern California Leadership Council, these folks have aligned their interests in a brilliant way. And through, through Senator Morgan's efforts, she's been involved in this for some period of time, uh, uh, really working hard on this. I think it's an idea, uh, when, when uh, Sunny McPeak was in the government, uh, she worked really hard on this in terms of the San Joaquin efforts. So it doesn't have a lot of noise, but these are really cooperations among regional go governments coming together, seeing they have a common interest. There's no such thing as the Sherman Oaks uh, 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 Air Pollution Control District, you know, where I live, but it's a regional thing that's affected. We worked at the LAEDC on a, in cooperation with Becky and a number of activities in which they're engaged in through nine counties to say, okay, out in Jim's district, uh, we're going to go after, we're going to all support this, this overpass and this, this deal on the transportation. So we all went back to Washington with one voice. So there's been a lot of extraordinarily good movement in that, in that space. Uh, not so much in government, there's still a lot to be done on the SAFO thing. I mean, I, I don't want to, I, I, I've, I've done some panels with them. It's an interesting play. There's 478 cities now in, 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 California, 88 counties. There's been some efforts. 58 counties. 50, I say 50, 48, 50, I'm sorry, 58 counties. Uh, um, some of them are so small. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, in, in any event, uh, uh, there's been some efforts afoot. I, I don't know. I mean, I think those are kind of local decisions. I, I, I've heard Paul talk about that. Those are kind of local decisions. Ultimately, if you're going to have local control, let the folks make the decisions as long as they're doing it for appropriate reasons. You'll be pleased to know the speaker has a bill to 
disincorporate the city of Vernon. I know, that's a big in deal. Southern California. That's a big um, deal. Look, I, regional government, I'm for it. If it works and you get rid of some other level of government, but if you create some other level of government, you know, I, I believe, here's my philosophy on government. It needs to be clear enough so voters know who they get to reward and who they get to punish. I, I don't buy into this idea that voters are apathetic and therefore they're not voting. I think voters who don't vote don't vote because they can't figure out who to reward and who to punish. No power. Um, and when, when you make it clear and say, this is the government and this is your job and everybody gets it, I'm for that. But we've just got these cockamamie systems. You know, if you don't like your, the, your school, so you come up here and yell at the legislature and they say, well, it's the school board. <clears throat> then you go to the school board and they say, hey, legislature makes all these decisions and you throw up your hands and you can't figure it out. You know, I'm not for anything that adds to the confusion. If you can make regional government work by getting rid of something or giving them responsibility that they're solely responsible for, I'm for it. If it's just one more level of government, uh, we have enough. I know there's another question, but you want to say something else on that? Or? Oh, that's okay. Just, okay. Just, just Fair enough. enough. There's a question, I think, uh, over here. The, she's coming right behind you with the microphone. Fernando. Uh, Fernando Guerra from Loyola Marymount University. We've been talking a lot about uh, broken systems and reform. Uh, obviously, the political system's broken, the economic system, but nothing's more broken in the state of California than the Republican Party. Um, you yeah, think? Yeah, no, no, no <laughs> statewide office holder, less than one third registered voters, less than one third of the state, or close to one third of the, uh, the state legislature, congressional delegation, at its lowest point in its political history. How do you reform it and fix it? Um, well, that's a topic of a much longer conversation. First of all, um, I don't think the Republican Party has hit bottom in California yet. Um, it's not inconceivable to me that absent, see, the reporter here is writing. Um, <laughs> Occupational hazard. Yeah, absent some really significant intervention, I would not be surprised if Democrats got two-thirds majorities in the legislature in the next election. Um, but the Republican Party's got a number of problems, um, most, most of which are self-inflicted. And if, oh, well, look, I, you know, you've got to nominate the right people for the right office. I mean, I, Cal, with the exception of Ronald Reagan and Arnold Schwarzenegger, in modern history, we've never elected a governor who has not held statewide office prior to being elected governor. We just haven't. So when we nominate Meg Whitman, who's never held statewide office, and the voters want that level of experience, we shouldn't be surprised when she loses. Um, and by the way, voters don't apply that standard to U.S. senators. They apply it to chief executives, but not U.S. senators. The last five U.S. senators elected in California have never held statewide office prior to being elected to the Senate. That's point number one. The Republicans need to learn to deal with the fastest growing ethnic group in California. The fact of the matter is, if you're a Republican and you have a moderate position on immigration, chances are you lose in your party's primary. If you don't have a moderate position once you win your party's primary, you've got a problem in the general election. That's part. One of the negative aspects of the redistricting is Republicans don't have to go out and compete outside their districts. There, with the exception of Abel Maldonado, who has a Senate, who had a Senate seat prior to his appointment as Lieutenant Governor, I'm not aware of any Republican in Congress or in the legislature that had to go out and get Hispanic votes to be elected. And politicians being who they are, they went and talked to the voters who could vote for them, um, and voters who were Hispanic didn't happen to be in their district. Those are two problems. Three, structurally, the California Democratic Party is organized better than the California Republican Party. They have a professional paid chair who understands politics and we elect a new volunteer each and every two years. I could go through this for a long time, but I don't, you know, I haven't been involved with the Republican Party for the ne last needless few years and it's... Um, needless to say, you have some ideas. Which uh, but I got, a, I got a bunch of ideas. Um, Fernando, again, and I do need to get out of the question. But go ahead, just go real ahead. quickly, I just want to say, Fernando, you, you, one thing, I was sitting with my buddy Rich Lieb last night smoking cigars in the portico over at the deal talking about this and look, looking at the, this issue of whether it's broken. I don't accept the fact that it's broken. I don't look at it. I look at it, we're, 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 this is a result of our success. It's important in terms of how we frame our approach to this. 
you know, we've been wildly successful. You know, people Democrats. Aren't, no, I'm not talking oh. Democrats. I'm just in California itself. Oh, I apologize. The system being broken. You know, people aren't flocking to South Dakota in great numbers or whatever the case may be. Maybe they are, but great numbers might be 3,000 people. But compared to California, people want to be here. It's a great deal. And so we've got new dynamics to continue to maintain this incredibly high standard of living that we want to maintain. And so we, we, we've got a, this new world order. We just got to figure out, look, our parents and our grandparents have dealt with great challenges, a lot greater than I think we have to deal with. We got it pretty soft. We got a lot of great things in our lives. So we just got to figure out, just like our generation, as Thomas Jefferson always talked about, the next generation and the next generation, how to make the democracy work. We meet some new challenges. We figure it out. We pass it to our kids. Let them figure it out. That's what this is about. That's all. You know, go to work. Go big or go home. <laughs> And yes. we've got time for one more because I think the clock will implode I, otherwise. I apologize, but uh, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, former Senator Becky Morgan, and I have two comments and a question for the gentleman. Uh, the question on how to reform the Republican Party. As a former Republican gone independent, if the party were to be open-minded to moderate Republican women, they would have more votes. Uh, That's right. And as to local, uh, regional government. I agree with that, but, I, but you know, Meg Whitman, all things considered, was a moderate Republican women, woman, and in the best year Republicans had, she still managed to lose by who did 13 not work points. Her, so. Who did not work her way up and was not supported from the, the other, beginning. You're right about that. I'm talking right. about people starting at the school board, the city right. council, the county level. That's right. I agree. That's right. And as far as regional uh, government, it gets confused all the time, and this happened when I was carrying legislation on regional planning. Everybody thought we were trying to have another level of government. What we're talking about and what Bob and I have worked so hard on is how do you get regions who have a common interest to come together that may cross city, county lines, and to answer uh, Kim Alexander's question, we do in fact have the California Stewardship Network, which is 10 regions in California that are working together, not only to improve their region, but to say this is what we need back, in, back home from the California legislature. And my question is, how can we make that happen? You know, They're not stumped, are they? No, no. You make it happen by advocating forcefully for your point of view and, and making a persuasive argument. Um, and, you know, I've seen it. I mean, first of all, you, we have JPAs. That's allowed. Second of all, I, I, I watched with half amazement and half pleasure at what occurred in Southern California with the advocacy for the transportation projects where you, you had cities basically being told to shut up and sit in the back. It's not your time by other cities. And at least in my region, they shut up and sat in the back. Um, but, you know. I just, I think, I, I agree with you, Jim. And I, I would just add one other thing. I, you know, I tried to do this when I was there and Gray Davis was trying to show how many bills he could veto, so he vetoed it. But, you know, a lot, yeah. of, a lot of the, a lot of, this when I was leaving, not in the coming in. When I was coming in, I got a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but but the, 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 um, when you look at the state and how it's administered, and if somebody has a, an issue with a problem, it's a transportation problem, they might have to go to, and it's in Bakersfield, they may have to go to Fresno to the Caltrans office, to the CHP in Los Angeles, to another agency in Sacramento, to another agency in, 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 in San Luis Obispo or whatever. When you look at how all the state historically has come together, um, it, there's, there's just completely disjointed. If you could just simply start with looking at government functions and aligning them, A, agree on what the regions are. Pete Wilson did the uh, economic strategy panel, right, Senator? Yeah, and there are nine regions. There's some other questions about what that looks like. Decide what those are and then align the state along those ways so it becomes easier as government can then organize itself around there. There's just some basic fundamental organizational building blocks that are missing in that regard. And, and trying to make that work. I would take that as a, as a first step. It doesn't cost any money of, of magnitude, and it's a way to begin to start thinking 
uh, systemically as opposed to what's happened. There's a number of other fixes, I think, that aren't the big fixes. And often, you know, you know this, you, you've been there, a lot of the big fixes are, are great press releases but don't actually accomplish anything. Uh, you know, and, and it's the little stuff like this that actually has impacts on how people actually begin to work together, and which is the whole underlying notion of what you're doing at the Stewardship Council of aligning interests. And with that, Bob Hertzberg, Jim Rolton. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Join me in thanking our speaker and, um, and our panel for a very, very interesting discussion. I knew when I invited the three of you to, to be up here, uh, we, would, we would all learn a lot from it. Let me just uh, uh, make one comment about this session sort of holistically. And there was a lot that I found actually very optimistic about this session, maybe more so than any of the other sessions that we had um, over the course of the last, starting the, uh, this evening and through today. And what I found really optimistic about it was that there were a lot of great ideas uh, thrown out there. There seems to be a lot of energy uh, around these issues of, of governance um, and fiscal reform today. Uh, we're, we're at a point where we have some things that have changed and we're gonna be finding out very soon what the impacts are in terms of our of our legislature and the way our legislators behave um, over the course of the next couple of years because the game has changed with redistricting and open primary um, and the simple majority budget. A lot, voters have put in a lot, of, lot more sort of accountability um, uh, into the process. And I also found a lot of areas of agreement uh, between, you, between you two. Um, I found particularly interesting, you know, around, around the tax issues and really want to wanting to explore can we come up with something, both how we go about collecting them and then what we do in terms of making sure that we've got some money around when, 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 when times get hard. So I, I actually found this uh, to be, you know, very good because we, we get to end on a note of optimism. Um, and, and of course, you're all uh, just uh, tremendously entertaining to have uh, together, so that's very nice. And, and, and John, it, it was wonderful to have you in, 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 the, in the midst of the two of them, and I'm sure we'll be reading about some aspects of this in the, in the days to come. Well, you're going to say, you're going to read this or publish <laughs> um, I just wanted to make a couple of closing uh, comments. I, most of all, I want to thank you all for, for, for being with us today and sharing this first uh, of PPIC, which would not have happened ha would not happen had it not been for all of these sponsors who I can't bring up on stage right now, so I'll just bring the card that, uh, that reflects all their names. Those of you who are here, thank you very much. PPIC uh, staff has just done a marvelous job. Thank you very much. Um, bo board, of, board of Directors for not only being here today, but for supporting uh, the, the work that we do and showing your, your interest and, and providing advice along the way. And so many, uh, so many people who were on panels, including everybody here today, got a call from me, you know, varying in panic levels about how much I needed you at this point in time, but I needed all of you and, 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 and the others who participated, our presiders, uh, thank you very much for, for making this a really special um, uh, occasion, a special first for PPIC. Uh, we're not done with our work in terms of, uh, of, of, of reminding people of the importance of planning for a better future for California. I noted this this briefing kit, which was our our 2010 update, which means it was the second time in the year that we um, we updated the information for the the. Uh, Though everyone who was on, on the November ballot. Well, we will have a 2011 edition, so you might want to pick up one of these on the way out if there are any left, because these are collector's items. This will go, this will go out of print, and a new one will go in print, um, you know, thanks to, to support that we have through our unrestricted donors funded PPIC that allows us to, to, to do more to, out, to outreach uh, to. This will be, uh, this new 2011 version will be uh, in the hands of our new legislators early in, in January, as well as uh, members of the executive branch. And, and will, of course, be on our website and available to all of you. Uh, we're, 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 I, I encourage you to fill out the evaluation survey, not just because I'm a pollster, but because uh, this will be very important feedback for us. 
we uh, have plans to have a 2011 speaker series around California's uh, future because there were a number of people who just were, didn't happen to be available on December 6th or December 7th who we think would, would be really great people to continue this conversation in 2011. Some of them are, are you know, uh, busy with the, uh, the lame duck session in, in Congress. Others are busy trying to figure out what they're going to say tomorrow, you know, and so without naming names, you know, we, we will be inviting other people, um, you know, to, uh, to participate in uh, the discussions about climate change and economy and education and governance uh, next year. And we uh, are very interested in what kind of feedback we get about what we did here today um, as those plans, uh, um, as, we, as we begin to make those plans. We have a number of reports that will be coming out early in the year that we, we believe will inform uh, these discussions. Um, Ellen Honnix uh, will have a report on water that will come out in February, which I think will be very important for every, everyone to read. Um, you know, I've, I've had the sneak preview that, that, that we have in, as part of our review, very important piece. Jed will be invi involved in a piece that is on 37, SB 375 and climate change issues, uh, which, I, you know, I think will be very important uh, and must reading uh, as well coming out early in the year. Job creation, education, finance, many of the issues that we've been discussing the last uh, few days and, of course, uh, we will continue to, uh, through the PPIC statewide survey, be informing everybody on um, the fiscal and governance issues early uh, in the year and, and how, um, how the public is responding to uh, the new plans as well as uh, the, uh, the new realities that, that, that the state will face. So uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion. We hope that we've sparked uh, something here that, will, that you will take uh, to your homes and working uh, workplaces and, and remain uh, interested and involved in these issues. I want to thank you very, very much for taking your time to join us here today, um, all of you, and I uh, wish you all a very happy holiday. Thank you.